means then that the wages of sin is not death. Well, what does this have to say about Jesus' death on the cross? See, it's just like, it's just like anything with the Bible. You can't just throw out something because you don't like it. It's not like a salad bar where you can say, well, you know, I'd like to keep this, but I'm not into the bacon bits, but give me the hard-boiled eggs and the cucumbers. It's not like that at all. If you throw out one teaching, it radically impacts so many other things in the biblical record. Are you with me? Now, now, now the reason I point this out is simply this. Because most of the, the, the conservative Protestant churches have sold the store on evolution, then they've also sold the store on the Sabbath. I mean, why would you keep the seventh-day Sabbath in honor of God's creating in six days and resting on the seventh if you believe that God created through millions of years? Does that, does that make any sense? But let's take it a step further. Why would God, in the book of Genesis, ask us to keep the Sabbath resting on the seventh day because He created in six days and rested on the seventh? We have just turned God into a liar. We're saying, no, you didn't really create that way, God, because the scientists have told us that you created another way. And incidentally, there are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scientists that reject the whole concept of evolution. And I wish I had time to, to go into the major presuppositions of science because true science squares with the Bible, but, but false science is absolutely, totally, patently against the Bible and the biblical record. Okay? So, if you want to give in to that worldview and you want to, you know, believe in evolution, you want to believe that you came from monkeys and amoebas and all, hey, good for you. But, but it's hard to reconcile that with the worship of the true God, the God of the Scriptures. Very difficult. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 13, I'm going to make this extremely, extremely simple so that no one will misunderstand. This is what's happening. Churches are clamoring for power. Political power, unfortunately. And you have politicians that need to get votes. And so what they do is they solicit the votes of whatever voting bloc can get them into office. Now this has created a deadly mixture in which you basically have the churches seeking for political power. By the way, the reason that many of the churches are seeking for political power is they've lost the Holy Spirit power. That's, basically, that, that's the short version of what's happened. The Bible says God gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey Him. And I've been to many of these churches where they're, who praise the Lord and sing it out and out. And listen, you can sing all you want, you can play all you want, you can feel good all you want, but the Bible says that God gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey. You call that the Holy Spirit. I've seen people dance like that in rock concerts. I've seen people dance like that in punk rock concerts. I've seen people dance like that at football games. Do not tell me that feeling good and dancing up and down is the Holy Spirit. There is no gift of dancing in the Bible. No spiritual gift. Now, I don't have any problem with dancing, but please do not tell me. Well, I should say I don't have problems with some kinds of dancing because some are obviously atrocious. The point is this. Don't tell me that that is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. That is not the evidence of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meat. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And listen, we sh as Christians should be joyful and joy-filled lives. Amen? Amen? But you might feel joyful in church. Yeah! But if you're not obeying God, who cares how you feel in church? Are you with me? In other words, let's not mix up feeling good and doing good. Because they are not the same thing. So far, so good? So the churches are, are, because the churches, many of them, have just turned away from the plain teachings of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit power leaves and leaves and leaves and leaves, and society is tanking, and many of the churches say, hey, wait a minute. We, our society is tanking. We see the moral decay. We see the degeneracy and debauchery around us. What can we do to rescue it? hey, I got a good idea, let's pass a law, right? And that's basically what's happening. The churches begin to pursue political power, and that is the world in which you live today, in which you have the churches are going after the politicians and basically soliciting the politicians, and the politicians are soliciting the church members, and what's ended up happening is, is that you basically have a church in which church and state are coming increasingly together. That sounds good to you, right? But, but be careful. Because church and state do not make good bed partners. They never have. Okay? It always spells intolerance and it spells persecution. Now, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 that there is going to come a time when the mark of the beast will be enforced on pain, first of economic sanctions, and then pain of death. Okay? Well, what is the mark of the beast? That was Bill's question. I think that's a good question. Now, if this is the beast here, right? Obviously not this man is the beast, but if this man represents the beast, okay? The beast power. Now, he, he of course, he, he is just a sinner that died and is in need of salvation. But the, the Roman church is the anti-Christian power, okay? 
Now, for the first time in the history of the United States of America, first time a president attends a papal funeral. First time in the history of the world a president attends. But not just one president. You've got the current president, the former president, and the former president. Then you've got Condoleezza Rice right here. And basically, all of the great leaders... I mean, can you imagine what would have happened if something tragic would have happened in that room? I mean, you've got most of the world leaders. Tony Blair is there. I mean, you've got dozens and dozens and dozens of world leaders there to honor just a man. Yes, in a sense. We're not d denying that the man may have done some good things. But, but to see them kneeling here, this is a change. A radical change in the United States of America. The problem is, is that most Americans are so tuned in to must-see TV that they missed it. They missed it. They were busy watching Jerry Seinfeld. They missed it. They miss the fact that the world is falling apart right before their very eyes. They miss the fact that slowly but surely the U.S. Supreme Court is, is becoming Catholic. Right? You just have Catholic member after Catholic member after Catholic member after Catholic. Listen, I have nothing against Catholics. Nothing at all. My father's a Catholic and I love him very much. The point is this, is that you have a system that does not believe in the basic premise upon which the United States of America is founded, and that is the separation of church and state. They don't buy it. They don't buy it for a moment. They believe the church and the state should be together for, among other reasons, the enforcement of their teachings. You say, wow, are you kidding? You think that's really going to happen? Yeah, I think it's exactly what's going to happen. The church, this is from the Catholic record, September 1, 1923. The church is above the Bible, and the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The church is above the Bible. C.F. Thomas, letter October 20th, 1895. Of course the church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So the claim made by the church is that we change the Sabbath to Sunday, and that is our mark of authority. Now that's their own claim. Now think about that for just a minute. The mark of the beast, the mark of the beast would be the mark of the beast. Does that make sense? Let me say it again. The mark of the beast would be the mark of the beast. It would be the beast's mark. Well, if we identify who the beast is, then we only have to ask the question, what do they claim is their mark of authority? And they tell us, the claim of our mark of authority is that we changed the biblical Sabbath to Sunday. So we have identified what the mark of the beast is. Now, the mark of the beast is not just the papal Sunday, it, which is actually a pagan holiday. It's, it's not just that. It's the enforcement of it. And that's really where the mark of the beast comes in. Look in Revelation chapter 13. And the critical word here, you'll see the critical word. And the critical word is in verse 12. It actually occurs in several places. 13, 12. It says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes. What's that word, everyone? Cause. Causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? Worship. Worship the first beast. Well, the first beast is the Antichrist beast that we've already identified. So this second beast, and a beast, of course, is a kingdom, is causing the earth to worship the first beast. Now, can you tr cause true worship? Can you force true worship? Can you legislate true worship? Yes or no? No, no you, you can't legislate true worship. And so the operative word here is cause. Now look at verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth. Notice, telling them, those who dwell on the earth, to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not what? Worship, Worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. Killed. And look at verse 16, he causes, there it is a third time, he causes, he causes, he causes. In other words, he forces. It's not optional. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, it's interesting, some people have understood this to mean a literal mark in the hand or a literal mark in the forehead. But this ignores the, the biblical context, okay? Now, keep your finger right here and go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's the fifth book of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Okay? Now, does anybody want to tell me what's in Deuteronomy chapter 5? What is Deuteronomy chapter 5? That's the Ten Commandments. That's the, that's the rehearsal of the Ten Commandments. Now jump down to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 1. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God and keep all His statutes and His commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be pro